But let me just tell you a little bit about Mr. Oswald. We call him the lone nut. <laughs> but here's a man who worked at a CIA base, who had his records altered by the military, who defected to Russia when he had no money. He takes a plane when no planes are available to get into Russia. He marries the niece of a high-ranking Soviet official. An intelligence uh, and, officer, right? That's right, and connected to intelligence. Slips across the Iron Curtain without leaving a trace. Threatens espionage while he's there and is not arrested. Lives in a community infiltrated by intelligence agents. He's befriended by a former spy. Is seen in close contact with at least two intelligence agents. That's back after he came back or in the Soviet Union? After he came back. Mm -hmm. He makes travel arrangements in the company of an employee of the CIA after he's gotten, uh, or before he went over there. He uses an alias, maybe several. He keeps an office in a building with other agents. He eludes detection by surveillance devices, some way or another. He gets a passport when sh one should have been denied. Okay, a second passport. Also very, very quickly through the State Department, That's right. understand. Uh -huh. And is finally shot down in a room crowded with police by a former informer for the nation's chief investigative agency, the FBI. The first in a two-part series on an update on the Kennedy assassination with Gary Shaw, the author of Cover Up, right now on Alternative Views. Of all of the programs which we do on alternative views, the two most important subjects that people like so much and request to see programs about, one CIA with John Stockwell, and the other are programs about the Kennedy assassination, particularly the one we did with Gary Shaw, author of Cover Up, oh gosh, I guess it was early 1979. Well, we're real fortunate to have Gary Shaw with us to do a couple of programs. Gary is an architect in the Fort Worth, Dallas area, and uh, unfortunately they only ran off about 3,000 issues of cover-up and because people are always wanting to buy it. Gary Shaw is one of the founders and members of the board of directors of the Assassination Archives and Research Center in Washington, D.C., which is a research center that has thousands of books and articles on political assassinations. It has massive collection of unpublished manuscripts. It has a large collection of photographs and computer information on various people that figure in political assassinations. So this is one of the major research centers in the United States on political assassinations. And Gary Shaw, for 25 years, has been researching the Kennedy assassination and has amassed a lot of slides, films, published materials. And today we're going to run through some of this material with him on alternative views. Mm -hmm. We're first going to see a slide presentation for this program of alternative views. Uh, Gary will take us through the history of the assassination, what the Warren Commission said, and then also what he thinks really happened. So Gary, welcome back. Thank you, it's nice to be back. It's a real alternative view that you'll be seeing here in, in, uh, in a few minutes with this slide presentation. Well, you know, we've been seeing, we've been getting letters and phone calls from all around the country where alternative views are shown and they all want to see you back again. So you're going to be pleasing a nationwide audience That's here. nice to know. It's nice to be back. And they also always want to know about cover-up now. It's out of print, right? Cover-up is out of print. I have uh, approached some publishers about updating it, uh, bringing it, that was 10 years ago now and uh, bringing it up to date, having it republished and making it available again to the people. Hopefully by this anniversary, but we're pushing it. Mm. Well, we'll give them a version of cover up of your book today <laughs> there we with pictures, with slides, information of all sorts. 
Okay, let's go ahead and start and see it. Okay, let's go back 25 years and uh, see real quickly the President and, and Mrs. Kennedy as they are departing the Texas Hotel in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. This is on the morning of November 22, 1963, and the President had just made a speech at a breakfast there for the Chamber of Commerce, and uh, he's getting in the limousine. They'd come to Texas to heal party wounds. There was a real split in the Democratic Party in Texas, and this was a, a real political uh, uh, hot spot on a couple of uh, different people's uh, minds. And uh, so they came as a, uh, as a big healing party to this, uh, this split in the, in the party. Here we see them. They, they took off from uh, Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, flew directly to Love Field in Dallas, which was, they just got into the air and, and right back down. They depart and uh, open a limousine through the streets of downtown Dallas. As you can see in this photograph, Governor and Mrs. Connolly are in the jump seat and uh, the President and Mrs. Kennedy are in the rear of the automobile. The two, two Secret Service men are in the front seat. They uh, had about an hour, hour and a half drive through the streets of downtown Dallas. You'll see that uh, just to, to the western end of the downtown portion of Dallas was a beautiful park-like area named for uh, uh, Mr. Joseph Dealey, called Dealey Plaza. In this little area, uh, you can see the old Dallas County Courthouse in the lower right-hand corner. Just above it is the, is the Dallas Criminal Courts Building and Sheriff's Department. The uh, street running straight up and down is the uh, Houston Street. The one running vertically across the screen is, is Main Street. The motorcade came down Main Street to the Red Courthouse, to the Criminal Courts Building, and then turned directly up on your screen, north in actual direction, and we're heading directly toward the Texas School Book Depository, which you can see in the upper portion of this particular slide. Elm Street is that curving street that you see come down in front of the, the School Book Depository and disappear over onto the left-hand side of the screen along with the other two streets under a railroad overpass. The area just uh, to the left of the Texas School Book Dep Depository is a uh, parking lot, railroad yards, and just in front of that is the infamous Grassy Knoll, mm -hmm. uh, the place where many of the witnesses said the assassin shots were actually fired. And so while we're on this photograph, let me just point out two or three things. This was taken approximately from the roof of, a ter of the Terminal Annex building overlooking Dealey Plaza. We'll talk about an important witness that was here. Uh, the little triangular place, uh, piece of grass area that you see between Main Street and Elm Street. Uh, there were several eyewitnesses in that area. There were several witnesses on the overpass that we'll talk about. And we'll talk about that area and the railroad tower and the railroad yards just above the grassy knoll and to the left of the Texas School Book Depository. But that just kind of shows you real quickly the scene of the president shooting there in Dallas 25 years ago. Gary, we might remind the audience that Oswald allegedly shot the president from the book depository that's right in the center there. That's correct. Curious thing, uh, why did they go and make that acute angle uh, low speed turn onto Elm Street instead of making the um, regular turn over there on that uh, on Main Street? Seemed like for it's security better. reasons, it would have been much better. Yes, that. in fact, that turn was contrary to Secret Service regulations for a turn, and uh, it slowed the limousine down to approximately 11 to 14 miles an hour, which made a sitting duck out of the president. And uh, there's been much speculation over the years about that. I think that turn actually surprised the Secret Service because when they were shown the route, and this is my understanding of it, when they were shown the route of the motorcade, uh, through downtown Dallas when they got to Houston Street and they just said and Stemmons Freeway is right over here We'll hit Stemmons Freeway and uh, be out to Market Hall and uh, of course they had been on Stemmons Freeway as they came into Dallas from Love Field So they really didn't know about that turn The turn was made because Chief of Police Jesse Curry was in the lead car And that's the way you got on to Stemmons Freeway is uh -huh. to make that uh, turn 
and I'm sure it was as much, or I feel like it was probably as much a surprise to that Secret Service driver uh, as to anybody. Uh, some uh, people who's, who uh, look at it as a part of a conspiracy say that this was done on purpose to take it by the book depository. And to slow and, the car down. And to slow, and to slow the, the car in down. In violation of the Secret Service. Uh, and that is, that is a question uh, that I think has to be asked. Mm -hmm. I think they knew that turn had to be made. And uh, they picked uh, the ideal spot. If you've ever been to Dallas, been to Dealey Plaza, you'll notice the, the closeness or the nearness of all of those, the Texas School Book Depository, the Grassy Knoll, and the nearness with which uh, everything is compact, uh, mm -hmm. perfect sitting duck situation for the President of the United States there. Well, I would think this route would have had been chosen quite some time in advance because Oswald took that job at the Book Depository uh, for some time. Uh, uh, well, how long if he you, had that job? If you take the position that Lee Oswald was involved in the assassination, yeah. uh -huh. which I don't necessarily subscribe to, then, then, then you take that position that there had to be a lot of prior planning and so forth. Or if they want but to make I, him the patsy. That's right. And I, I, my opinion is is that, uh, yes, they knew they were going to try to kill him in Dallas. There was quite a bit of planning. Uh, the execution was almost to perfection, the actual shooting portion of it. And uh, I feel like they had practiced well in, a, in some area, um, even a mock-up of this mm. uh, particular area. But uh, they knew that that turn had to be made to get on. And uh, so, yes, I think there had to be an advance notice of where the motorcade was going and how it was going to get there. Okay. Well, let's continue with your slides here. Fine. This shows the uh, presidential limousine making that turn off of Main Street on to Houston, going now directly north, directly toward the school book depository. The dark arrow you see points to the Vice President Lyndon Johnson, who is also in the motorcade, just a couple of cars behind the President which is very, very unusual, and in fact against regulations for the Vice President and the President to be this near together uh, and uh, so open to uh, assassination. So he was very, very much in a position to see everything that happened, and uh, that raises another question. Next slide shows the, um, the nearness of the Secret Service follow-up car to the presidential limousine, which is directly in front of it. Secret Service personnel are on the, the running board. There's eight of them in that follow-up car, and they're right on the bumper of the presidential limousine as it approaches the Texas School Book Depository. One of the questions you have to ask, this is probably the easiest shot from that sixth floor school book window. Right the, there at that right location. Right here at this location, because the president is moving directly toward that window and is a perfect shot from that sixth floor, yet he did not take it. This slide shows the president as he turns directly in front of the school book depository. He's brushing his hair out of his eyes as he usually did. And it's only a split second later that the president is, is uh, you can see him waving at the crowd. This is from the opposite view and is actually a slide from the famous Abraham Zapruder, Zapruder mm -hmm. film. And the president is waving to the crowd. He's uninjured at this particular time. He's about to disappear behind a, a road sign that uh, comes between Zapruder's camera and the presidential limousine, and you'll see that happen. The president was shot at that time. Very soon thereafter, within the hour, a fellow by the name of Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested uh, in nearby Oak Cliff, a suburb of Dallas, at uh, the Texas Theater. Why he was arrested is one of those question marks, but let me just tell you a little bit about Mr. Oswald. We call him the lone nut. <laughs> but here's a man who worked at a CIA base, who had his records altered by the military, who defected to Russia when he had no money. He takes a plane when no planes are available to get into Russia. He marries the niece of a high-ranking Soviet official. An intelligence uh, and, officer, right? That's right, and connected to intelligence. Slips across the Iron Curtain without leaving a trace. Threatens espionage while he's there and is not arrested lives in a community infiltrated by intelligence agents. He's befriended by a former spy, is seen in close contact with at least two intelligence agents. That's back after he came back or in the Soviet Union? After he came back. Mm -hmm. He makes travel arrangements in the company of an employee of the CIA after he's gotten, uh, or before he went over there. He uses an alias, maybe several. 
He keeps an office in a building with other agents. He eludes detection by surveillance devices somewhere or another. He gets a passport when sh one should have been denied. Okay, a second passport. Also very, very quickly through the State Department, that's right. I understand. Uh -huh. And is finally shot down in a room crowded with police by a former informer for the nation's chief investigative agency, the FBI. Well, so that's Mr. R Oswald. R Ruby was uh, an FBI informant. Uh -huh. Well, there were other relationships that, uh, uh, that Ruby had with the FBI in addition to the CIA, did he not? Uh, he had connections with the FBI. Mm -hmm. In other words, they came to him constantly in 1959. Uh, this was uh, probably when he was doing most of his work with, uh, with gun running. Uh, to the Cuban exiles and had contact uh, in that regard. So Oswald is just too visible a figure to really be involved in such a secret operation as a political assassina assassination that he made a point of showing himself to the public with a lot of newspaper pictures of him, interviews. He was involved in his Fair Play for Cuba right. organization in New Orleans that got a lot of attention in that city and that's just not the kind of person that does uh, a political assassination, unless they're just completely crazy, and I guess that's the hypothesis. That's the hypothesis. That's, that, being projected. that's, that's the reason they say the lone nut. But crazy people <laughs> don't get around the Soviet Union that's right. the way he did and get back and forth the, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in such a peculiar fashion. As one author put it, the fingerprints of intelligence are all over Lee Oswald, okay. and I think that's without question at this stage of the game. Of course, here you see Oswald being in, interviewed by uh, newspaper people at Dallas City Hall. And here you've seen uh, being shot famous, by yeah. Jack Ruby. Uh, this, we call Lee Oswald the lone nut. This is the lone Avenger. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we have no connection with Oswald in the, cons in, a, in, a, in the killing of the president. There's no connection to Jack Ruby in the killing of Oswald. And yet here we find a man who ran a local nightclub strip joint who had ties to the underworld, was a procurer of w women, he dealt in narcotics, was an FBI informant, was a friend of over 50% of the Dallas police force, and uh, what we call a real all-American boy. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, at this stage, he was escorted to the kill site by the assistant chief of police of the Dallas Police Department at that particular time. And how was he able to get into that uh, police uh, building with a gun to assassinate Oswald. Didn't they have any security whatsoever? Does this strike you as a little bit odd? He started on Friday night when Oswald was arrested by coming up to, uh, to the police headquarters, giving the newsmen and the Dallas police officers who were on duty sandwiches, coffee, you know, anything that he could do. And he knew everybody. So he became highly visible on the, in, on the very first okay. evening. And he stayed that way through Saturday and through Sunday morning when they um, made the effort. Oh, he had extensive and heavy relationships with the Mafia and was traveling to and from He Miami came from Island. Chicago, and uh, he was heavily involved with the Mafia there, and he was known as the Mafia's man in Dallas, That's very true. simply. And the gun running, was that in support of CIA operations? It was not in support of CIA operations, but there were CIA personnel or contract agents involved in that. And he was doing that in connection with a, with a gentleman by the name of Tom Davis that we'll come back and, and talk about a little bit. Okay. So uh, here's later. another highly suspicious character, this Jack Ruby. He's not just a man who loved the president and got revenge as the official story was. That's the official story. Right. And, uh, of course, the latest investigation, which was completed in, uh, in late 1970s by the Congressional Committee appointed to do so, said very quickly. Jack Ruby was mafia. He okay. was organized crime. And it's also interesting that both he and Oswald kept trying to get a, an independent lawyer or somebody to talk to, and they wouldn't, neither was allowed to do it. He wasn't at that time. That's mm -hmm. correct. Okay, of course, after Oswald was killed, there was no need for a trial for Lee Oswald. <laughs> That's fortunate. So our new president, Lyndon Johnson from Texas, appoints a Blue Ribbon Commission and uh, has been pointed out many times by others other than myself, there was not a friend of John Kennedy on that particular commission. In fact, one of the members is Alan Dulles, who uh, was fired by John Kennedy after the 
Bay of Pigs fiasco. The head of the CIA. The head of the for CIA many years for the many, many years. That's correct. One of the one of the real builders of the CIA. Uh, chief Justice Earl Warren, of course, was the uh, the chief um, in the of the committee and uh, one who was almost coerced into taking that position. He did not want to do it, but Lyndon Johnson convinced him that he must do it. And hence we have the name Warren Commission. Yes. And he was head of the Supreme Court, was he not? He was head of the Supreme Court. He had Court. a lot of prestige and was generally respected. So this put a blue ribbon seal on it That's as right. it were. So All of these men were, were supposedly highly mm -hmm. highly respected men. Okay. Gerald Ford Gerald was on Ford there, was of on. course, and okay. later became president of the United States after being vice president. And uh, we've learned since then that uh, he was he played a dual role. Yeah. He he was the uh, FBI's informant for the secret sessions of the Warren Commission. Mm -hmm. They even patted him on the back and gave them one of the special FBI attaches that you handcuffed <laughs> to your hand. I'm sure Mr. Ford felt extremely gratified at that responsibility <laughs> given him at that time. Many people know of the Warren Report. That's the loan book laying on the floor in, in the foreground. And many people have seen the various New York Times versions or the Associated Press versions. This is the government's uh, printing office version. But not many people know that there were 26 supporting or allegedly supporting volumes to that report. In other words, that report was footnoted to these 26 volumes to show that, that they had done their homework and that the conclusions reached in the report were actually backed up by actual evidence. My friend Penn Jones, who's one of the real heroes in this particular case, was fond of saying the problem with the Warren report is that they forgot to underline in it where they lied to us because by taking their own 26 volumes you can discredit a major portion of the report's conclusions and findings. Which is a lot of what authors did. Which they is what we the, did yeah. immediately and of course uh, in addition to that there are volumes and volumes and volumes in the National Archives and the FBI headquarters and the various agencies some of which have still not seen the light of day and we're still filing freedom of information requests and lawsuits to get the government to release the information on this case that happened 25 years ago. What, what really amazed me in the first program we did with you was that you told us about a memo which went to the Warren, which the Warren Commission uh, came out or the staff uh, gave to the Warren Commission in which they said at the very start that they were there to pin it on Oswald. That's right. The FBI had already within three days of the assassination pinned it on Oswald and a memorandum had been issued by Nicholas Kotzenbach, the Deputy Attorney General, uh, to Bill Moyers that said all speculation should be cut off and a report given to the American people. This was on November 25th. Okay, a report given to the, the American people that would satisfy them that Oswald was the assassin and that he had no Confederates. Yeah. This is now called uh, damage control <laughs> as well as cover-up. I guess yeah. it was cover-up cover up early on completely. and now damage control is a right, euphemism. Yeah. This is a uh, photograph of, uh, that was famous, yeah. published on the cover of Life magazine of Lee Oswald. A very damaging photograph to him because it shows him holding the rifle that killed the president. On his hip is the pistol that allegedly shot uh, the Dallas policeman J.D. Tippett. In his right hand, he's holding the two communist newspapers. <laughs> and uh, when shown the picture, of course, Mr. Mr. Oswald says, "That's my face, but that's not my body." Hmm. Uh, the House Select Committee on Assassinations had a photographic panel that said it was not a composite photograph, but they did not convince anybody. No, okay. but the shadows so are it's still yeah. it's still in question and uh, will remain so yeah. until more sophisticated techniques come about with which we can prove it. Of course, the Warren Commission said that this lone nut, Mr. Oswell, fired three shots from that six-floor school book depository window, all of them toward the uh, presidential motorcade. The first, they said, could have missed, may have been the second shot it missed, but at least one shot struck the president in the back, exited his throat, hit Connolly, went through him, his body, his 
right wrist. I'll show you a diagram in just a minute. And then a third shot that struck the president in the head and killed him. This is a reenactment done by two FBI agents. And uh, you can see the marks that they've placed on uh, the FBI agent in the rear, which is representative of uh, the president. One way up in the uh, upper neck, I would call it, and then one in the, in the upper back. And then the other man is representing John Connolly, and you can't see where he was hit. But uh, that's the actual uh, coat worn by jo uh, Governor Connolly when, when he was shot. And uh, if it were a little clearer picture, you could see a chalk mark just below uh, oh, his right uh, shoulder blade is where he was struck. This is a diagram that I did just to kind of give you an indication of what the single bullet theory is because <laughs> yeah. the Warren Commission came up with this theory that the president and the, and the governor were both hit by the same bullet. And uh, actually because of the chronology or the chronometer given us by the Zapruder film where you can actually see the effects of the bullet hitting the people, to say that there were more than one bullet that did this damage is synonymous with saying that there was another shooter, which mm -hmm. they could not do. So here in actuality is what happens. The bullet comes from the sixth floor window from the left of your screen, hits the president in the back, exits its throat. It has to make an upward trajectory to do that because it's making a downward trajectory in a lower portion of his back. Then it comes out just below the tie knot or just above the tie knot uh, of his throat, makes a left hand downward, I mean a right hand downward turn and strikes the governor and just below the right shoulder blade goes through his chest, blasts out about four inches of his fifth rib, exits just below his right nipple, strikes the main bone of his right wrist, shattering it, exits there and embeds itself in his left leg. Left Very thigh. active bullet. Very active bullet. Let me show you a picture of that bullet and and uh, you can see the bullet that perpetrated that great feat. A miracle. There's not a scratch on it. There's not a scratch on it, nor is the nose bloodied. Mm. And uh, this became the, the pristine bullet, or the miracle bullet, as we've termed it over mm. the years, because they were never able to duplicate that. Every shot that they fired, and I'll show you some pictures of it in just, uh, in just a minute, every shot that they ever tried to duplicate that with either shattered the bullet or heavily, heavily blunted it. Here you can see this is the, uh, the wrist of uh, John Connolly. You can still see the, the white specks are actually fragments of the bullet that are in his arm even mm. today. Mm. But, uh, and to the right is the miracle bullet. The only thing missing from that bullet that's said to have done that damage to the wrist is a little nick that was taken off for spectrographic analysis. Uh, otherwise, the bullet is, is whole. Next slide shows a cadaver's wrist shot through the main bone of the, of, the, of the cadaver's wrist, and you can see just that one shot, that one bullet, blunted it very, very severely. Okay. Not even the, to mention the fact that the bullet had to change course several times. Maybe it, it was one of those special uh, change, cruise missile guys. Change course, but then pause in midair because <laughs> yeah. I'm going to show you in just a minute oh, okay. just how many, how much time elapsed between the time that you can see the president actually react until you see the the governor. And this collapse. is the official version, just one bullet. They didn't one bullet. say Oswald shot three bullets that shot Kennedy and Connolly and whatever. It's just one bullet. That's, that's just the activity of one bullet. They say, okay. they say three shots were fired mm -hmm. because they found three shells on, okay. the, on the sixth floor. One did this damage that right. I just indicated to you, and then we'll come back in a minute and talk about okay. the blown head shot, which was yeah. the second of the three okay. shots. Okay. So that's the way they said it happened. If it didn't happen that way, how did it happen? And I'm a firm believer, let's, let's, let's look at the evidence. Let's see what the evidence says about it, follow it wherever it might lead, and see if we can come up with some alternate scenario of how the president was shot. In Dealey Plaza, and, and I've diagrammed it this way, I believe it's, that this was a group of very, very professional assassins, and they had it very well planned. The first shooting sequence occurred at the fourth set of road stripes as you came off of Houston Street into Dealey Plaza. The president is shot for the second time at the sixth set of road stripes. And so I'll call that attention to you. I'm just going to call it kill zone A and kill zone B. And, uh, but before they get to that, 
I'm calling this shot the false assassin because I think that the planners of this wanted to call attention to the sixth floor window where Oswell allegedly was lurking in the shadows to kill the President of the United States. This shot was fired overhead, never hit anybody, never even came close to hitting anybody, and uh, completely uh, hit the sidewalk, bounced, came all the way across Dealey Plaza, uh, across Elm Street and, and Main Street, and hit the curb and actually ricocheted either a piece of the bullet or a piece of the concrete, bounced up and hit a man by the name of Jim Tay. What are, what are the witnesses to that or what evidence do we have? Mrs. Donald Baker, who was a witness, said the bullet hit the pavement near the sign. Roy Skelton said the bullet hit to the left of the JFK car. He was looking toward the car, so his left would be the president's right. And the cement carried away from the Texas School Book Depository. Policeman Cheney, who was riding shotgun on the motorcycle just to the right of the president, said the first shot missed. Mary Woodward, a news person for the Dallas Morning News, said the first shot missed. Sheriff Bill Dacre, who was riding in the, in the lead car, was looking in the rearview mirror, and he said the first shot missed, and he actually said he saw it hit the concrete and bounce. Eugene Aldridge also said he was watching television that afternoon, and a, and a KRLD Channel 4 CBS affiliate newsman actually took pictures of a, a mark in the sidewalk where witnesses said a bullet had hit. Well, he waited until the Warren report came out and there was no mention whatsoever of that. So he began to call the FBI office. And he had gone down that day and saw the mark himself. Not only did he see it on television, so after he called the FBI, and this was later in 1964, after the commission was out and no mention was made of it, he went down there and somebody had filled that in. Oh. Very slick. And so obviously the eyewitnesses say that a shot hit there. This is while the motorcade is under siege. The first shots have been fired. And uh, the limousine, you can see Mrs. Kennedy uh, reaching over and grabbing her husband's wrist. And uh, you can see that the uh, Secret Service men, at least on the right running board, the left as you look at the picture, are looking backwards. The shot came from the rear or hit somewhere to the rear, and it would be just to the left of that uh, that, that, uh, that that shot would have hit the sidewalk. Here is a picture taken of that mark on the sidewalk. And uh, it uh, does not exist today because of Dallas Morning News brave photographer, I mean a newspaperman, actually drilled that out and took it and had it analyzed. Unfortunately, all metallic substance had been scraped out of it, but they could tell that there had been a porous uh, filler placed mm -hmm. in it at one time or the other. Here you can see the arrow points to a man, and I hope you can see it on the television screen, a man standing over there. This is a bystander by the name of Jim Tagg who was the only other person besides Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Connolly who was wounded. And he was wounded slightly on the cheek by either a fragment of the bullet, as I said, or by a piece of concrete that flew off of the curb. Here's a picture of where that fragment of the bullet or the bullet hit the curb. That's a man's hand that's shadowing that so that the photograph can be taken. But that's a point. In, in line with the trajectory of a bullet that was totally shot beyond the motorcade and not even an attempt was made to hit the motorcade with that. And yet it calls attention to that window because the people in the, the latter part of the motorcade that are driving directly toward the school book depository see the, the gun barrel sticking out of the window. And uh, it, the, uh, one of them says, one of them that the, after the last shot, is fired at the motorcade, this same individual seems to lean out the window as if to admire his handiwork. And to draw attention. And to draw attention to that window. Okay, this is the kill zone A I was talking about earlier, and uh, we'll just take the, the president's wounds. I call this gunman number one and gunman number two. That's a triangulation of gunfire, very strategically located. And by the way, that's a very short distance from point one to point A and from point two 
to point A. And I'll come back and show you some photographic evidence of a man in that position at the time of the shots in just a minute. Let's see, a point one, is that on top of on the On top of the school book depository. Oh, okay. Okay. Here's the president as he comes from out from behind that sign that took his view from Zapruder's film. And you can see that he's reacting to a shot. And uh, it's probably that back shot because when the uh, FBI looked at the wound, they estimated and gauged that wound to have entered the president's back at a 45 to 60 degree angle. The Oswald window could have only been 20 degrees or so. So the only point that would be anywhere near a 45 to 60 degree angle would be moved down to the western end of the two school book depository and go on the roof, and then you can get that kind of a trajectory. Okay. This is the Warren Commission's version of how that bullet went into the president's back and exited his throat. The artist who painted this, notice it's not a photograph, the artist who painted this actually never saw the wounds. He was told what to paint. Okay, so you can see that a wound in the back has moved up into a wound in the neck and is exiting more in line with what would be consistent with going on and hitting Governor Connolly. This is the autopsy sheet. It's verified. It has the signature of uh, George Berkeley, the president's physician who was there at the time. And if you look at the back view, you can see that the wound in the back is way down below the collar. Mm. That's consistent. Uh, here is, again, an artist. The same artist did this. See how far he placed the bullet up. But yet, if you take the president's coat, where the, where the wound shows in his coat and in his shirt, the dark mark I placed on the drawing myself is, the, uh, is where the location of the, of the end shoot into the president's body would be. This is the president's coat. The entrance of the bullet was five and three-eighths inches down from the collar. This is his shirt. It was five, the hole in his shirt was five and three-quarter inches. So you can see how everything is consistent with a back wound, not an upper neck wound. The next slide shows a skeleton. And uh, the president's chief physician, George Berkeley, said that the wound in his back occurred at the third thoracic vertebra. Well, the third thoracic vertebra is in the exact location as shown by the coat, by the shirt, and by even the, the uh, Secret Service personnel who were following the president who said they saw the president get hit in the back, not in the neck. Gary, this might be the point to discuss uh, Kennedy's body, what happened to the uh, corpse afterwards. Obviously, this theory could be confirmed if there was a close examination of the body of Kennedy after the murder. What actually happened and what is the story, the later story about Kennedy's body? Okay, that's a good uh, uh, a friend of mine, an author by the name of David Lifton, wrote a, a great book called Best Evidence and uh, titled that because in a murder case, the best evidence of how the crime was committed is the body. Uh, a correct autopsy will show number of shots, direction of shots, type of bullets, everything that you need to know about the, the, uh, the case is contained right there. The president's body was forcibly taken by, from the Dallas authorities and flown to Bethesda, Maryland, to a naval hospital there, and an autopsy was performed. When the, auto when the body r arrived there for, uh, for autopsy, something had happened. The doctors at Parkland left a slight one inch to one and a quarter inch incision for a tracheotomy over this wound that they called a wound of entrance. Every one of them called it a wound of entrance. The nurses, this is the hospital that all trauma victims, all gunshot victims come to. They know a wound of penetration or a, an entrance wound from an exit wound. So he just barely made an incision so that he can insert the trach. They said the back of his head was out and brains were, the president's brains were falling out on the table. But this wound, when it arrived at Bethesda, had become a three and a quarter inch gaping gash with all evidence of the penetration wound obliterated. In other words, none of the dark flesh that surrounded it, it had all been cut off. And even the slides of any 
tissue that was taken from that has disappeared has disappeared from the evidence uh, contained within the National Archives. So an entrance wound will be quite small, and the exit will be a large hole. Right? That's right. The entrance wound will actually be smaller than the projectile because of the pliability and the elasticity of the skin, and it will go through, and then the skin will, will come back. Where it exits, it's the, the the bullet is normally expanded or turned, and it's coming out at an odd angle or or something of that nature, and it tears the skin and makes a much larger opening normally than the uh, than a wound of entrance. So this means that somebody monkeyed with the body in transit That's to correct. DC. Has to have happened because even the pre president's brain uh, was not in the cranium, and uh, surgery had been performed in this area. None of the Dallas doctors had done any surgery to the president's head. And was there any testimony that there was a wound in the back or other parts of his uh, Wound body? in the back, actually, the, uh, an FBI report says that the doctor probed it with his little finger mm -hmm. to the first knuckle, and that's as far as he could go. He said this wound does not continue any further. And then someone of a higher authority told him, do not probe that wound. Mm. So that wound was never probed. We're left to guess as to what happened to it. Uh, we can't guess too much because uh, if it continued downward at that angle, it would have gone into his lungs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's evidence that he did have a, a wound of the lungs because when he came to Parkland Hospital, there was bubbly blood coming from this wound in his throat, which indicates that there had been damage done to, to the lungs. But the big, uh, the big blow, the one that really killed him was the blow to the was the shot to the head, right, that blew his top of his head off? That's possible, but this could have been a killing wound, mm. the, the wound of entrance here. Uh, I think that probably the reason that you have the three and a quarter inch gaping gash when it arrives there is that a missile had to have been uh, removed from that because there was no exit of that or the one in the back. And uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, he received a semitor shot, although it went through his jaw first, but it went through and it lodged at the brain stem area back here, which is a life or death matter. You separate that brain stem from your spinal function there and, and you're immediately dead. And uh, that could have happened to, uh, to the president very easily. So what are the conclusions from this? The, the conclusions are that there were two FBI agents who signed a receipt for a missile taken from the president's body at the time of the autopsy. A missile? Now, uh, that's, that's not fragment. That's not a missile. bullet? Well, a missile is a bullet. Okay. 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 They call it a missile. Uh, if it's a fragment, they call it a fragment mm -hmm. of a missile, or a fragment of a bullet. And the bullet is the so-called perfect bullet? We, we don't know. Or is it disappeared? It disappears. When it's never heard of again. Okay. And has never been satisfactorily explained where it came from. We don't know because the, the magic bullet had mm -hmm. already been found on a hospital stretcher at Parkland Hospital and turned over to authorities. This bullet was removed at Bethesda and during the autopsy and disappeared, though we do have the documents, fortunately, that, uh, that talk about it. So the Warren Commission report says that a single bullet and a single wound killed Kennedy and that they have the bullet, the so-called magic bullet. And you're suggesting that it must have been more than one bullet That's and more than one, than one wound. Okay. And did they also come from different angles? And we're, we'll we're, get into we're that. fixing to get into okay. that with this very next shot. Excellent. Because the next slide shows, again, the, uh, the one to the left I want you to pay particular attention to. The era going in is where the Warren Commission said the bullet right. entered. The third thoracic vertebra is the, is the other area, arrow, and is where the bullet went in. And again, notice the verification by Dr. Berkeley on that, on that sheet. Here are the two documents that I was just telling you about. They very definitely stipulate that a missile was removed from the president's body at the autopsy at Bethesda. We have not seen them today. The bullet possibly came from the roof because that's where the angle, the trajectory would take it. This is a amateur film taken right after the assassination of a rifle that uh, shows up. We don't know what kind of rifle, don't know that it had anything to do with it, but the, uh, the person who was taking the film thought that these officers and detectives had gathered around that for a reason and, and dubbed it on their own film, The Assassin's Rifle.
And this and is not do, Oswald's rifle. This is not Oswald's okay. rifle, nor does it come anywhere close to right. looking like it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there we do know that uh, there was rumored to have been a rifle found on the roof of the Texas School Book Depository. I want to go and talk about um, that bullet that was almost simultaneous, okay, mm -hmm. to the bullet in the back. And if you go back to that picture I showed of kill zone A, you'll yeah. notice I had uh, one assassin on the grassy knoll and mm -hmm. one on the roof. Right. I want to talk quickly about that bullet that, that uh, is the wound of entrance here, okay. as opposed to the back wound that we were talking about a while ago, because it was so simultaneous, and I think this was directed by someone on site, uh, either by radio or by, by signal. And uh, when it occurred, this, this particular bullet of entrance was the one who almost paralyzed him and possibly killed him. But J. Lee Rankin said it seems quite apparent now, and this was in 1964, after the Warren Commission had met in secret session, they were meeting in secret session, it seems quite apparent now since we have the picture of where the bullet entered below the place where the picture shows the bullet came out in the neck band of the shirt in front. Here we are two months after Hoover has issued his report of the lone assassin, and, and they're already still talking about this wound in the back being below the wound in the front, which creates a trajectory that would miss Governor Conley. So he's saying that, hey, we need to do some more study on this, even in January of 1964. Okay, simultaneous with the preceding shot, uh, here at uh, Zapruder frame, uh, 228, you can see uh, the president clutching at his throat. It's real important to note that all the doctors and all the nurses uh, said that that was a wound of entrance. But I think that it's more important to see how they tried to cover up that fact. In a January 1964 transcript that uh, came from the Warren Commission secret se uh, sessions, John McCloy, who was a member, says, I think we ought to take a look at the grounds, and somebody ought to do it and get the picture of this ankle to see if it is humanly possible for him to have been hit in the front from a shot fired from that window. Maybe it is. Of course, we know it's not, unless mm -hmm. they could bank a shot. And then Life Magazine also kind of contributed to that. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, on December the 6th, they published their uh, memorial edition of... Uh, Kennedy's death, and in that they had some nagging rumors, and one of them was how the president was hit in the front, in the throat, from that window, which was in back of him. They said it's real easy. We have the Sapruder film now, and it shows the president turning around in his seat, exposing his throat to that window. Oh, of course, we know that didn't happen. No, the Sapruder film doesn't show that at all. At all. Unfortunately, the, the author or the writer of that particular article died of cancer in 1965, so we could not go ask him who directed him to write that or what was his reasons for writing that Well, particular Life magazine story. also was one that doctored up that uh, snapshot of Oswald with, ho with him holding all the rifles. In they contributed heavily to the yeah. framing of Lee Harvey Oswald in this. Okay, next slide just quickly shows how the people reacted and shows that there were shots from the president's right front, because these witnesses you see laying on the ground uh, said the shots came directly over my head toward the president. From and they, the grassy knoll. From the grassy knoll, and they hit the, they hit the dirt. Uh, the lady in the, uh, the red coat is Miss Jean Hill. She saw a man in dark clothing across the street and saw him run from the scene and attempted to, to follow him, got over there and was stopped by a man who, served, who uh, showed her Secret Service identification, or official identification, let's put it that way, and told her she could go no further. Hmm. Here is a slide taken almost simultaneous with the first shot. You can see the arrow points to uh, the head of President Kennedy. If uh, I want you to pay close attention to the little low wall that juts out from the Stimmons Freeway sign, the little white wall. On the left. On the left, jump, juts out there. I'm going to blow it up with this next slide. There you can see above the, the uh, low white wall there on the grassy knoll, a man. It's been definitely identified by analysts to be a man wearing a dark clothing, dark hat. You can see his facial features. 
And the House Select Committee even went so far as to say that there was something, a long object, protruding from this person at a 45 degree angle. Of course, they could not determine. It's my opinion that that's where the shot was fired from, and he quickly disappeared. A second uh, photographer, almost at the same instance that that previous photograph was taken, shows the same person behind the little low wall, just to the left of the Stimmons Freeway sign. This shows the same little low wall uh, within six seconds after the uh, photograph you just saw a while ago. And uh, the presidential motorcade has not even cleared the uh, underpass, but I'll blow up again the little white wall, and you can see that the person has completely disappeared and uh, has gone from the scene. So a shot from the front, you can see how the police ran over there. One of the motorcycle patrolmen jumped off uh, and just dumped his motorcycle and ran up there pursuing uh, the person that he shot, that he thought fired the shots. And over 50 eye and ear witnesses in Dealey Plaza said the shots were fired from that grassy knoll area. And the Zapruder film clearly shows Kennedy getting hit in the, in the forehead by a shot from the front, which kicks his head back. But the Warren Commission absolutely ignored all, all of this. All of that. That's correct. That's the next two shots. This is the uh, final two shots that hit the president. This is in kill zone B, or the sixth set of road stripes and comes from the southwesternly sixth floor window of the school book depository and from the picket fence just above the grassy knoll to the left. That's number three and number four. Okay, the, uh, the president is shown here just before he's, he's hit with the fatal head shots. You can see the position of his head. You'll see how the, they doctored that particular photograph in just a minute. Here is the explosion. The, the great intensity of the bullets that, that struck the president's head. That's pieces of his brain and skull uh, flying through the air. You can see the explosive nature of what happened. That's the president's head, and it's just opened up on the right-hand side. This, I believe, was from the, the shot from the rear in the school book depository. Now, eyewitnesses oh. saw a gunman standing back in the shadows in that southwestern, not, not the sniper's nest window, but the one on the far westerly end of that same floor. As the, poter, as the motorcade arrived, he was standing back in the shadows cradling a rifle. So this shot, I believe, came from that area, it was a perfect shot, and uh, more of a glancing blow to the side of the president's head that opened it up. And you can see how open it is. Here, those two slides together, done in sequence, you can see the uh, great movement of the president backwards as the second shot overrides the first shot and hits him as the priest said and as uh, the uh, president's chief aide said in the right temple and blasted out the rear portion of his head. Look at the distortion of the artist version. The president's head is never in that position, but to uh, get their wounds like they needed them, they put the president's chin down on his chest and drew this version of the entrance and exit wound, when in actuality he did lose that portion of the side of his head, but he also lost a big portion of the occipital region, and a piece of the occipital bone was found on the southern side of Elm Street past the curve and in a rearward position from where the president was actually hit. Remember there were motorcycle, a motorcycle patrolmen riding to the president's left rear. They were struck with brain tissue with such force they said they thought they themselves had been hit. Oh and then that's Malcolm killed up the president's aide pointing. He's saying the president, he's, he's at a press conference and he's saying the president was hit in the right temple. Uh, this lady in the foreground took a very, very important uh, motion picture that uh, has never seen the light of day. I, I've interviewed her. Her film was confiscated by people who identified themselves as either Secret Service or FBI. And uh, that film would be very important because it would show not only the Texas School Book Depository, but also all of the grassy knoll at the time of the shooting. The final shot in uh, the scenario 
but it's a crucial sh shot also because it planted evidence, pointed the, the finger to that assassin's window and the assassin's lair. And as I've already stated, the people said that the man who fired the shot seemed to have lingered and hung out the window as if to call attention to himself. But the bullet actually struck the ground and would have passed over the motorcade's head by about 12 to 15 feet. And it struck near a manhole cover. It was seen by eyewitnesses, photographed by newsmen. But what happened was that the, uh, the ground was plowed up, it was called attention to, and a man who was identified by Police Chief Jesse Curry as an FBI agent came over and reached down into the ground and you can see that it's, there's something in the grass. I know he wasn't a rock collector, <laughs> but he picks up something in the grass, stands up and you can see he has his hand closed, and then he puts it into his pocket. And that particular bullet is never heard or seen from again. Very important evidence, again, uh, destroyed or hidden to this day. What are your conclusions from the information you've presented? The conclusions are real simple, that there were multiple shooters in Dealey Plaza, and multiple shooters means conspiracy, more than one. Uh, where it leads to from there is, I think, probably more important and, and of more concern to us as citizens of the United States, because it was within the hands of the United States government that this evidence was covered up, because we have uh, testimony is altered. We have evidence mutilated and distorted, obscured, destroyed. Everything that could be done to evidence is done in this particular case. And so someone high up in our federal government made the decision to cover up the true facts about the death of the president. But it took considerable coordination and participation among a lot of people to do this, to execute it, to plan it, execute it, and then to cover it up. Right. And I guess that'll be the topic of our next uh, program, where we'll go through the theories of what actually happened in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. You can give your analysis of the facts, what you think happened. We can discuss some of the other theories. Then we can discuss some of the new evidence and new controversies that have arisen concerning the Kennedy assassination in recent years and what this means for us as a democracy, why we shouldn't forget this event. Great. Okay. I look forward to it. Be sure to watch the next Alternative Views for the second in this two-part series on an update on the Kennedy assassination. If you'd like to contact Gary Shaw, here's his address, P.O. Box 722, Cleburne, Texas, 76031. He, of course, is the author of Cover Up. Also, Gary Shaw is a co-founder and member of the Board of Directors of the Assassination Archives and Research Center in Washington, D.C. The AARC was established as a long-needed, centrally located, permanent center for the study of assassinations, particularly helpful to scholars. And this is all assassinations, national and international, historic and current. The research material includes several thousand books and articles, a massive central research file, unpublished manuscripts, photographs, tapes, a computer index of 15,000 names and events, and the various FBI and CIA documents which are relevant to assassinations, particularly those from the House Select Committee on Assassinations. There are also FBI documents relating to the Robert Kennedy murder and the attempt of the life of George Wallace. We'd like to thank our crew for these two programs, Director Brian Lynch, our camera people Ronnie Mag, Joanna McCulloch, and Beverly Garrett, and our audio man was Jack Hopper. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. That's another address you can write down so you can write to us as well as Gary Shaw. Goodbye. <laughs>